Good morning, everyone. I think it's only fitting that I get to speak after we just heard about biobanking. Um, you can imagine what we biobank. Uh, so the title of my talk is Translating Metagenomics, and I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the history, the topic of the microbiome, and try to set the stage for the two experts who will follow me. So first things first, this is a big data conference. I don't need to tell you that this is a hot topic. We can actually look at the data. Uh, so this is a slide that demonstrates a number of publications with a given key word um, that are in PubMed. In the blue line, you can see cancer genomics. In the blue line, I'm sorry, in the green line, you can see cancer genomics. In the blue line, you can see big data. And in the red line, hottest of them all is the microbiome. Um, don't worry, big data is catching up. And the first big data publication with the keyword was in 1936. Um, so clearly, this is a hot topic. You know, but this is not a new topic. We actually first learned about the microbiome in, I would argue, the 1600s. Uh, does anybody know who this is? Uh, this is Anton van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, he was one of the early pioneers of using the first microscope. And what he did was what probably any of you would do, is he took a toothpick, he scraped it against his teeth. Remember, this was like pre-toothpaste, pre pre-toothbrushes, pre-flossing, although probably none of us floss. Um, and he looked at what he found in that gunk under a microscope. And when he looked at this, he actually found all of these different little organisms. Um, he actually didn't call them organisms, he called them little animals or animacules. He saw them wiggling around, he saw that there were all kinds of different shapes and sizes, and he actually described the first oral microbiome. At that time, he didn't make a value judgment about microbes, he just said they are there. Um, and this actually laid low for quite a long time thereafter. However, these two gentlemen, Robert Koch and Louis Pasteur, did a lot in the 1800s to actually push forward the theory of germ theory. And so when we think about microbes now, if I were to ask a general lay audience or even a medical audience, I've actually had the opportunity to do both of those things in the last couple of weeks here at Stanford, when I ask them how they feel about bacteria, um, most of them say they don't feel that good. Um, it makes them feel bad. And, and I actually attribute it to these two guys. Right? They actually found out that microbes are bad. Louis Pasteur was famous, actually, for solving a really big problem. Um, and that problem was when wine goes bad. And so actually, that was what he cut his teeth on as a microbiologist. He was hired in a major wine region, uh, making region in France to solve the problem of wines turning into vinegar, and he invented the process of pasteurization. He went on to do really great things in the rabies vaccine, et cetera. Robert Koch, of course, was really important for actually what later became into Koch's postulates. Now, you know you've really made it, and there is a children's book written about you, um, and this is actually the children's book that I grew up with. Um, so be careful what you give your seven-year-olds to read. Um, this is The Value of Believing in Yourself, a story of Louis Pasteur. The war against microbes was launched, um, and we thought of microbes as universally bad. And this guy, Joseph Lister, actually of now Listerine fame, um, realized that the reason most people actually died of surgery was not because of blood loss or the surgery itself, but in, because of infections that complicated the surgery. And so what he decided to do was to take carbolic acid, impregnate pieces of lint with this carbolic acid, and put it on surgical wounds. In so doing, he actually improved surgical outcomes dramatically. Uh, this is actually one of the most impactful interventions in the history of medicine and surgery. The next one was actually brought on by Alexander Fleming. Um, and Alexander Fleming, as you all know, invented or not invented, but discovered penicillin and applied penicillin and, for the first time, antibiotics in the treatment of medical diseases. So this was our war against microbes. And we thought to ourselves, microbes can definitely be bad. But when we put this in perspective, if we look back to Anton van Leeuwenhoek's day in the 1600s, you know, he thought maybe they could be good or neutral. He had actually no pers perspective on these. He said they're just there. And in order to answer this question of whether they're good, bad, neutral, or it depends, we really needed better ways to measure microbes. So in comes the era of sequencing. So we jump forward another 100 years, and now we can take human tissues, body fluids, stool samples, spit, skin, you name it, and we can sequence it. And after we sequence it, we can actually figure out who's there. And we do that by aligning these sequences to the reference genomes of all of these different organisms. 
And in so doing, we can really, really start to measure in much, much more detail what's going on. So what are we trying to do now in the field of microbiome sciences? That previous slide basically summarizes a lot of what we do. We take samples, we sequence them, we figure out who's there. Um, we really are actually doing this not just to do a big cataloging project, but also to find out how we can use the greatest amount of data for the greatest good. And from my perspective, there are two big ways we can do this. We can try to keep healthy people healthy, or we can try to help the really sick people do a little bit better. Um, you're going to hear later on about projects that aim to keeping healthy people healthy, but in my laboratory, we focus on the latter, which is we find the sickest people we can, and we try to improve their health by impacting their microbiome. So a brief introduction, our laboratory works on patients who have undergone stem cell transplantation, which is a curative therapy for certain cancers. It works incredibly well, except for when it doesn't. The complication rate from hematopoietic stem cell transplantation therapy, formerly called bone marrow transplant, is actually exorbitantly high. Approximately 30% of our patients actually die in the first year after transplantation, and only half of those people die because of a relapse of their leukemia. Everybody else dies as a complication of our therapy. So there's a lot of room for improvement here. This is a typical timeline of a transplantation patient. Um, you can see that over on the far left, that's when we actually start the transplant. We give tons of chemotherapy, we give antibiotics, we give radiation. And at that dotted line, we introduce stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells from a donor, a healthy donor. We introduce a small number of stem cells, and then we wait for them to grow into a fully competent immune system. Okay, this is not dissimilar to what happens when a baby is born. And throughout that period of time during which the immune system is developing, patients have tons of problems. Infection, relapse, graft-versus-host disease. If they're lucky enough to make it out to a late time point, a secondary malignancy. Throughout this time period, they develop idiopathic disorders, which is just a nice word that means, I don't know what is causing your disease. This is an opportunity for intervention. What we know is that low gut microbiota diversity in this patient population is related to poor survival. And this is lovely work done at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, by Eric Pamer and his group. What you can see here is a very simple experiment. They took a bunch of transplant patients, they collected their stool. They sequenced it using 16S sequencing, and they figured out what types of microbes were there, mostly bacteria in this case. They then categorized these microbiota into high diversity, meaning lots of different types of microbes, medium diversity, and low diversity, meaning not a lot of diversity of microbes. And what they found was in this Kaplan-Meier curve, one of the strongest predictors of all-cause mortality was having a low diversity in your gut microbiota at the time of engra engraftment. And that's that red line. Okay, you can even see that the outcomes aren't that great even in our high diversity patients and that blue line, where at three years after transplantation, survival is below 75%. Okay, but clearly, a lot of room for improvement. If we could take the people from the red line and put them onto the blue line, wow, we'd actually save a lot of lives. Now, this is very exciting, and this is actually where a lot of our microbiome field is, but how can we use big data to help us go beyond association toward causation. And in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to give you a few examples of how we might do that. We need to go from measuring to modeling to intervening. This is the cycle that I think we should use to actually use data to help us improve health. And I'll give you examples of how we do that in the microbiome. Number one, we have to measure. In our case, we take usually stool, we extract DNA, we sequence it, and we ask questions like, who's there? What bacteria are present? And what are they doing? In order to analyze this deluge of information, we actually need to build nice computational pipelines that allow us to deal with both structured data problems and unstructured data problems. This is an example of asking that question of who's there in a transplantation patient. Um, this is a time course of a typical patient who had undergone transplant. And what you can see is the green bug actually increases over time. And you can clearly tell that the gut microbiota diversity in this individual falls throughout that first month after transplant. We need to model. Um, and that really is a way to understand how these microbes interact with each other and what they're actually doing. Use this data to create models. And while all mo models are probably wrong, some are very useful. Um, so it's important to go through this process. We do this in the process of going from genomes to metagenomes. And we use a variety of technologies that you've probably had the chance to hear about over the course of this conference. 
this is an example of how we actually start to try to model genomes from metagenomes in microbiome samples. Lastly, we try to intervene. And how can we intervene? Um, most of us think about altering the microbiota by giving antibiotics. But in this particular case, we can actually use all kinds of other therapies as well, including live microbial therapies like probiotics, going all the way to fecal microbiota transplantation, as well as prebiotics, or foods that are specifically eaten by certain microbes in our gut, not others. And this is a way to also alter the microbiota. Um, so with that, I'm going to leave you with this concept of us needing to measure, model, and intervene. And I'll come back to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.